Welcome back to another word study. Uh, this Sabbath we're going to be looking at uh, um, what turned out to be a very wide and extensive uh, subject, the Spirit. And uh, I had thought that we could focus, of course, on the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of Jesus, a lot of different phrases we can look at. And uh, we will uh, look at that as we uh, focus our attention in the Word and in the Spirit of Prophecy. Before we begin, we always want to ask for God's leading and His presence, His Spirit, to guide us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity. Spend some time in your Word and in your inspired writings. And we ask that you will guide our minds and our uh, thoughts as we explore this important subject of your Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We have on the website uh, some study notes. And if you would like to uh, save that, you can open it up, follow along with us, print it out later on if you'd like. Uh, six pages. <laughs> there was a lot of material this time. We're not going to cover all of that. But uh, let's look at uh, the two tools we'll be using are eSword. It's one of the many uh, Bible uh, study programs. It's a popular one, and so we'll be using that. And the Ellen G. White uh, uh, White Estate application that has access to all the Ellen White writings. So let's uh, let's look in eSword here for a minute and see what that has for us. In the Bible, if you choose the Bible, uh, you can do Old Testament, New Testament, in the Bible, and we choose phrase or any words. We're just going to, first of all, just put in the word spirit and see what we have here. 456 verses. Some of the verses have spirit in there twice, so you got 505 total occurrences. And you know, the very first time, first occurrence is an important uh, aspect of our Bible study is the Spirit of God moving upon the face of the waters and, uh, before creation, or at the time of creation. And uh, my spirit shall not always strive with men. And the next uh, occurrence there, uh, at the time of the flood, the Lord says this, and his days should be 120 years. And so there was 120 years when the Spirit strove. <laughs> it would not always strive with men after that, but at least at that, that time it did. And so on. So we can go through here, but that's an awful lot. We really need to narrow this down. And you can look at, uh, let's say, Spirit of God. We wanted to look at just those phrases. 26. Oh, that's much more manageable. There's the very first one we saw. And uh, Pharaoh, <laughs> he discovers in Joseph, here's a man who the Spirit of God is. Isn't that what Paul tells us? Uh no, you're not. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit, and uh, the Spirit is in us, and He dwells in us. And He was in Joseph. So there's how Esword we can use to uh, search and look for various phrases and, and go down, narrow our search by using uh, more precise descriptions. And then also in the uh, writings of Ellen White, let's look in this application. We can do a search here if we typed in spirit. Uh, let's see here. One more time. 59,534 occurrences. That's a lot. And again, it helps if we uh, re narrow this down. Now, if we don't put any double quotes, as we've pointed out before, you'll just get all variations of the words. But if we use a phrase, let's do this again. Spirit of God. Well, only 9,000. <laughs> That's still an awful lot. Uh, Spirit of Christ. 2,000. Spirit of Jesus. 308. So we can uh, look at all these various things. This is a, not too bad of a list to go through. And so on. So let's go back to our uh, notes here, and I'm going to just summarize some of the things I've spent last week going through uh, 
or the earlier part of this week, looking for all of these and bringing them together for you. Look at all the different kinds of spirits there are. There's a familiar spirit. Um, remember, Paul, Saul went looking for a woman who had a familiar spirit, so you could find out. You want to know his future, because the Lord wasn't speaking to him anymore. Spirit of jealousy, a haughty spirit, a humble spirit, a patient spirit, a proud spirit. In fact, if you... Um, Let's go back to our e sword here. And if we said, um, let's say the phrase in spirit. Yeah, only 16. And here's where we see these humble in spirit, patient in spirit, proud in spirit, grieved in spirit, poor in spirit, strong in spirit, um, troubled in spirit, fervent in spirit present in spirit, and so on. So there's not too many of those. These different qualities, kinds of spirit. An excellent spirit, spirit of deep sleep, so on. Now, one of the things that we notice, remember what Jesus said, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and life. Let's use that verse, just John 6, 63, and use that as a search narrowing strategy here. So we'll go back to the sword. Let's just put the word spirit, life, not as a phrase, but all words. Oh, only 13. Job, he granted me life and preserved my spirit. Granted me life, preserved my spirit. Sort of a parallel way of saying the same thing in different ways. So life and spirit are linked together. Jesus used them. The words that I speak to you are spirit and life. And here they show up as well. The Spirit of God has made me. The breath of the Almighty has given me life. So here breath and spirit are paralleled. And made me and given me life. Which is what happened when Adam was created. He formed him from the dust of the ground. He breathed in him the breath of life. So the spirit, breath, and life. They are very closely associated, related. Uh, the tree of life. Uh, but perversion there is breach in the spirit. And then we got life in the spirit again. Therefore, I hated life. I'm vexation of spirit. <laughs> That's uh, Song in Solomon speaking. And all these things is the life of my spirit. Life of my spirit. Spirit and life go together. Here's the verse that uh, Jesus said. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, spirit of life in Christ Jesus, made me free from the law of sin and death. Law. What's a law? It's a, um, a statement of fact. It's a rule. It's instruction, it's commands, <laughs> the, uh, the commandments, the law, all of these things. And it can tell you what is the law of life and the law of death. It's going to predict or describe what is going to happen when we uh, follow that law. There will be life, or if we follow this law, it will result in death, sin and death. So... Um, Christ says that the spirit is life. The body is dead. The spirit is life. Now you may start noticing there's a, a, a relationship between body or flesh and spirit and life. The spirit gives life. The letter kills. Uh, the spirit uh, shall the spirit reap life. If you sow in the spirit, you're going to reap the spirit. You're going to reap life. You sow for life, you're going to reap life. You spell in the spirit, you're going to reap the spirit. The spirit and the life go together. The spirit of life from God comes into those after three and a half days. You know, that was the three and a half times, or the 1260 years, 42 months. And after the end of those dark ages, the spirit of life would enter into the, witness, the two witnesses, which are the Old and New Testaments. And so the Bible uh, society started to uh, blossom and come to life. And God had blessed those efforts, and uh, they went around the world taking Bibles uh, to all the countries, missionary 
activity uh, exploded. The spirit and the bride say, come, take of the water of life and freedom. So there's some relationships uh, we see in those, putting those words together. And one Bible text that I'd like to look at also, and it doesn't have the word life in it, but it's talking about the spirit and the result of not having the spirit, which is death. And uh, so the spirit is life, and without the spirit is death. And that's James uh, 2.26. So let's look at that. James, oh, i got to switch over to it here. Switch over to Esword. There we go. And let's look up, uh, just put in James 2.26. There it is. For, it's the last verse in the, in the chapter, so it's at the bottom of the page. For as the body, the body, that's the flesh, or the physical, without the spirit, there's the spiritual, is dead, so faith without works is dead. The body is something you can see. Works are something we see as well. It's the result of uh, the body doing something. The spirit we don't see, and faith we don't see. Faith is uh, invisible, it's something inside of us. And the spirit is invisible, it's inside of us. It's what, it's what makes us think and uh, do and, and plan, and it's uh, what makes you, you, and me, me, and everybody, uh, we're all individuals, unique, our, our characters, this is our spirit. The, f the body is the hardware, the spirit is the software. And we can understand that. Uh, having computers, and I've got one here on my lap, and we're looking at that today. And the spirit is the software in there. That's the instructions, the commands, the code, the lines that tell the processor exactly what to do and when to do it and under what conditions. And that's what the spirit operates in our lives, too. And so our central processing unit up here uh, takes instructions and uh, has memory and all the same components that we think of in a computer. But it can't run without the hardware. The same thing with the computer. But there's two aspects to the spirit. There is the knowledge, the uh, wisdom, the instruction, the understanding, and there is the power aspect of the spirit. You remember uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verse 24. Let's look at that verse. This was uh, one of uh, E.J. Wagner's favorite verses, he said anyway. Let's look here for search. And uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 24. Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. So he's the power. Without this computer being plugged into a power source, it's not going to operate. But it also has to have instructions and code and uh, software that tell it what to do. So the spirit is two aspects of it, both of which are invisible. You don't see the power. You see the results of the power, just like Jesus said the, um, to Nicodemus. You don't see the wind. You don't see... Uh, the, but the effects of the wind you do. The trees are moving, the leaves are moving, you can hear it. Uh, you can see the effects, the works. Um, but you don't see faith, you see the results, of wor the works uh, that uh, result from faith. The body without the spirit is dead. You don't have life. You don't have power. But you also have to have instructions to tell you what to do. You're a hearer of the word, but you're also a doer of the word. And uh, so the, the two go together. And the words in the Bible, in the original languages, Hebrew and Greek, both for spirit, Hebrew, ruach, which is breath, wind, spirit, can also be understanding, mind. And in the Greek, uh, pneuma, uh, which from we get our English word 
pneumonia or pneumatic, uh, pneumatic tires, uh, uh, pneumatic tools, uh, they run on air. You pump up the tire with air, it's a pneumatic tire. And uh, so we under can understand a little bit about uh, how that operates and what it means. And uh, breathing and respiration. Why do we say respiration, inspiration? We breathe in, we inspire. We breathe out, we expire. Oh, what happens when somebody expires? Hmm, they die. The spirit's no longer there. They're not breathing anymore. Um, you inspire, you breathe in, and you have life-giving oxygen. <laughs> you got to have oxygen uh, to live. The spirit of man uh, is in him, it says. And the spirit quickeneth. Well, let's look at some of these. Spirit and life. There's some more of those out there that we can follow. Do our search. Spirit and life. Spirit. Let's see. Quicken. I'm going to say partial case. The spirit that quickeneth or gives life. That's an old English word for resurrection or to, to bring back to life, to give life. It is the spirit that quickeneth. Now, that's true because the spirit has to do with life. You always saw that connection. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and life. But the spirit of him that raised up Jesus, who's that? The Father. From the dead. He, the Father raised Jesus from the dead. And the spirit of the Father. Why do we say the spirit of the Father? Because what did uh, Jesus tell the woman at the well? Let's look at this. God, spirit. New Testament. John 4, 24. God is a spirit. He tells her that he is a spirit. And so the spirit of God, well, that's himself. He, if he is a spirit, it's him. Uh, let's see. Spirit. Yep. This is going to be interesting here will also quicken or raise up your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. Yeah, so the spirit of the Father dwells in us. What did Jesus say? Uh, in John 14, verse 9, do you not believe that the Father dwells in me? I am the Father. The words, in verse 10, the words that I speak unto you, they are not my words, but the Father that dwells in me. He does the works. So there you see the, the visible uh, uh, evidence of the Spirit being in him. The Spirit is, of his Father is invisible. It's dwelling in him. But the results, the works, are visible. You can see them. Oh, here's an interesting one. 1 Corinthians 15, 45. The first Adam was made a living soul. Right? He breathed in him the breath of life, and he became a living soul, a living being. The last Adam, who's that? Yes, Christ, Jesus, the Son of God, was made a quickening spirit. Now, was made is added, but it's parallel to the first man, Adam. The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam, a quickening spirit. I mean, this is understood. A quickening spirit. Well, the Father is a spirit, Jesus said. And he also told uh, Nicodemus in uh, John 3, verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. Uh, that was uh, designed into the creation of this world, wasn't it? At the very beginning, he said, he brought forth all these living things out of the sea and in the air and on the dry land, every one reproducing after their own kind. So that which is born of the flesh, their kind is flesh, they're going to produce flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And the Son is begotten of the Father. The Father is spirit. The Son is going to be spirit. He's made a quickening spirit. He was the Word of God in the beginning with God. God was spirit and the Son was spirit. They're both of the same kind, the same divine nature. So now let's go back to our search. The first man and um, 
being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. The Spirit brings life. The Spirit is life. The flesh, probably nothing, it dies. We are mortal. Okay. Let's uh, look at some other ways in which we can uh, look uh, about the Spirit being within us. Uh, a lot of, not a lot of texts, but the ones that uh, are available are interesting. Let's go back here and do a search on that. Spirit within. Oh, that's New Testament. Let's go to the whole Bible. So, for the arrows of the Almighty are within me, he drieth up my spirit. Uh, I am full of man. The spirit within me constrains me. It's a law of the life, the law of the spirit of life. Ezekiel 36, 26. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart of flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. Next verse. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and do them. That's the spirit that constrains us. That's what uh, Job was saying back here. The spirit within me constraineth me. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. The spirit was overwhelmed within me. Psalm 142. Therefore my spirit overwhelmed within me, same thing. With my spirit within me, I desire thee in the night. Yea, with my spirit within me will I seek thee early. Um, where is he? Oh, this is Isaiah 63. The angel of his presence um, carried them, bore them all the days of old. And then he says, where is he that brought them up out of the sea with the shepherd of his flock? Now, this isn't talking about just Moses. It's the time of Moses. But who brought them up out of the sea? Who led them in the pillar of cloud by day and the fire by night? That was the angel of the Lord, which we understand to be the shepherd. Uh, and Moses is, of course, the shepherd. A lot of parallels there. Where is he that put his Holy Spirit within him, within Moses? And remember he said, um, finally, Moses got overwhelmed with all the demands on him. And God says, well, I will take the spirit that is upon you, and put it on the 70 elders. Jethro's uh, recommendation that they divide and uh, have some extra help for Moses. And the spirit entered into me. This is Ezekiel. And uh, so he's entered into me. He's inside within thy house. That's different within. A new spirit within you. I will put a new spirit within you. One heart. Yes, a heart of flesh. Same thing again. I will give you a new spirit uh, will I put within you? I will put my spirit within you. Down here, Ezekiel 36, 27. That's the one that we just read. And I formed the spirit of man within him. The spirit is within us. Immediately Jesus perceived in his spirit, okay, he reasoned within themselves. So they reasoned within themselves, with their spirit. That's where the reasoning takes place, is uh, in your spirit. First fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves. And, of course, the text that uh, we often think of, 1 Corinthians um, 1, uh, 2, verse 11, it says, For what man knows the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, likewise, uh, this is a parallel, man is made in the image and likeness of God, and uh, God is showing the angels how this relationship works between the Father and the Son. He, built, he makes man and woman, two, two beings. And uh, so the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. Now, it doesn't say within him, because the Spirit of God is different than the Spirit of man. God has a Spirit that is not limited to just being within him, as ours is. His spirit is sent forth into all the worlds, he says. Uh, seven spirits of God, in Revelation chapter 5, verse 6. Um, Jesus is shown as a lamb standing before the throne. Let's look at that. As it had been slain, having seven horns, that's the horns are a symbol of power, omnipotence. And seven eyes, 
all-seeing, omniscience, all-knowing, which are also the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. So there's omnipresence. See? The spirit can be in different places, sees and knows all things, but it's his spirit. It's his knowledge. It's his understanding uh, of God. So we can um, look at some, let's look at some other examples here. I'm going to come back and it's got my title up. There's a relationship. Um, God sent forth his spirit of his son into our hearts. Now, the spirit is in our hearts. as another in within uh, concept. And uh, there's a connection between the spirit and the heart. Sihon, king of Heshbon, the Lord thy God hardened his spirit made his heart obstinate. Same thing, heart and spirit. Uh, this is when they came to Jericho. Their hearts melted. The people in Jericho had heard about the Israelites and what had happened to them coming out of Egypt. And uh, neither was their spirit in them anymore. So their hearts melted and their spirit was gone. Uh, set his heart upon man, neither gathered himself his spirit in his breath. The uh, Lord is uh, nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and such that be of a contrite spirit. So the heart and the spirit. David said, create me in a clean heart, and renew a right spirit within me. There's the within again. There's the uh, broken heart and contrite uh, spirit, <laughs> or the other way around. I commune with my own heart. I can think. You think? Do you think with your heart? Uh, my spirit made diligent search. Same thing, heart, spirit. It's really our minds. That's where we do our thinking. But uh, in Bible uh, times, uh, our, their anatomy was uh, about a foot lower than ours. And so when we say our, our heartaches, uh, they would say their bowels were moved within them. Um, and we think with our brains, but they uh, commune with their heart. So here's, uh, they had not their heart right, and whose spirit was steadfast. My spirit overwhelmed within me, again, and my heart within me is desolate. A merry heart, make the cheerful go, but um, sorrow of heart and the spirit is broken. So you can have a broken heart, you can have a broken spirit. Merry heart doeth good like a medicine, broken spirit drieth the bones. So on. Uh, so you see this over and over and over. Uh, I will give them one heart and give them a new spirit. And we've read those uh, texts as well before. So I'll we'll skip over a lot of that. The hidden man of the heart, a meek and quiet spirit, Peter says. So let me get back here. A lot of connection between heart and spirit. Now, let's look over on the next page, Spirit and Flesh. We've talked about this uh, somewhat. Um, let's look at uh, that connection here. So we put, uh, we already got Spirit up there. Now let's put Flesh. And just 31. Mm -hmm, yeah, this is at the flood again. But His flesh, this is my Spirit and His flesh. And my flesh stood up, the hair on my flesh stood up when I saw a spirit pass before my face. This is an interesting one. Now, the Egyptians were men, not God. Their horses flesh, not spirit. You see the parallels here. Men and flesh. You know, horses and men, they're, they're created beings. But not God, who is spirit. And um, then we saw all these things, the stone heart and the heart of flesh and the heart of the spirit, new spirit which I put within you. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. So God's plan, his ideal for us, is that his spirit dwell in our flesh. And the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now this has the concepts of the, the two aspects of spirit is that it is both uh, instruction and uh, uh, commands and uh, wisdom and uh, uh, the code that makes the computer run. It's 
willing. It's got the uh, understanding. The flesh is weak. But the spirit is also powerful. The spirit has power. It's willing and power. Spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. That's Mark's version of that verse. For a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see I have. Yeah, that's true. A spirit is not visible to our eyes, to our physical uh, capabilities. That which is born in the flesh is flesh. That which is born in the spirit is spirit. We looked at that verse already. The spirit quickens, you know, what does I give our spirit and life? So a lot of connection between spirit and flesh as opposites. The flesh is the physical. The spirit is the spiritual. The flesh has to do with humanity. The spirit has to do with divinity. And, of course, it's God's plan and his ideal for us that eventually he is going to um, dwell in our flesh that's what he wants to do now, and that we will partake of the divine nature. What does the Spirit have against flesh? Uh, he's going to send the Spirit of his Son into our hearts. Uh, that was Galatians 4, 6. I didn't have flesh in that verse, so we don't see it. But the word right before it, 4, 4, well, he sent his, it doesn't have spirit in it. Sent the, uh, his Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And born of the flesh, born of a woman, absent in the flesh, present in the spirit, um, quickened by the spirit. There's the same one again. Put to death in the flesh, quickened by the spirit. So in some of the overlap, we see some of these things uh, showing up uh, again and again in different contexts. Spirit of wisdom, spirit of truth. Here's, these are ones that you can look up. And see the connections here. Spirit of God, Spirit of the Lord, one of the Spirit of the Lord. And um, let's look at that. Over here. Spirit, and we're going to do a phrase this time. Spirit of the Lord. Phrase 31. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah. The Spirit of the Lord came in the camp of Dan. They're the judges, and this is the book of Judges. The Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. This is Samson, and he rent that lion as if he were a king, a kid. <laughs> and the Spirit of the Lord came upon Samson again. He goes down to Ashland, and he, he kills all these guys, get the 30 men, get the changes of raiment that he promised he'd give if they got the riddle. Well, they got the riddle. Uh, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and they bound him with cords, and he broke them. The Spirit of the Lord came upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy. Oh, who's this about? And you shall be turned into another man. That's young King Saul. Uh, Samuel is telling him the Spirit of the Lord is going to come upon him, and he's going to prophesy. That's what the spirit of prophecy is. And you shall be turned into another man. Was Saul another man? Well, he changed uh, because of the spirit dwelling in him, he was a different person. And he needed to keep that spirit, and he would have stayed a different person. And so Samuel uh, anointed David, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. The Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, oh dear, and an evil spirit, says, from the Lord, troubled him. When, when the Spirit of the Lord departs, then there is nothing to prevent Saul from being invaded by evil spirits. And in that sense, it's the result of the Lord. It's his result of leaving and departing from Saul. The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. And so on. Well, is that a kind of the Spirit of the Lord asked him to speak. Oh, this is Micaiah before Ahab. And uh, the Spirit of the Lord admits the congregation. They're still talking about that. Spirit. Oh, this is Isaiah 11. Here's the seven spirits. You always want to know what the seven spirits in Revelation uh, 3, verse 1. In the Revelation 4, verse uh, 3, is it? Where the spirits of the flame, uh, uh, the seven lamps burning with fire before the Lord, which are the seven spirits. Well, it's the fire that's the spirit. The fire oil, rain, water, um, 
These are all symbols and the dove of the Spirit of the Lord. Rest upon him. The Spirit of Wisdom and understanding. We already talked about how the Spirit has to do with searching and understanding and wisdom and instruction. The Spirit of Counsel and Might, its power. The Spirit of Knowledge again. Wisdom, understanding, knowledge. And the fear of the Lord. So there's seven spirits there. If you count them up, one, uh, the Spirit of Wisdom, two, three, uh, four, five, six, seven. Because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it, and uh, the people are as grass. That's what's going to happen at the end when God reveals His Spirit and um, the glory of the Lord. And his Spirit and His power and His character are all part of who He is. That's the Spirit of the Lord. This is an interesting verse. Who hath directed the Spirit of the Lord, or being his counselor, hath taught him? This is the original occurrence, Isaiah 40, verse 13. And Paul quotes this twice. Once in Romans 11, 34, he says, For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Isn't that interesting? He says the mind rather than the Spirit of the Lord. Well, we understand that the Spirit is instruction and knowledge and wisdom and understanding. And uh, the mind is where he does the searching and thinking and uh, communing through the mind. And who hath been his counselor. So he's quoting this verse. And he does it again in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 16. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? He uses the word mind again that he may instruct him. And he goes on to say, but we have the mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Philippians 2, verse 5. We have the mind, the spirit of, of Jesus in us. Galatians 4, verse 6. God has sent the spirit of his son, the mind of his son, <laughs> into our hearts, into our mind. The heart is the mind. It's where we do our thinking. And um, very, very interesting connections between these. Uh, I'd like to spend a few moments looking at the spirit of prophecy. If we look at uh, this spirit of Jesus Christ, now that's Philippians 1 verse 19. He says, the supply of the spirit of Jesus Christ. Um, let's look at uh, how Ellen White in the spirit of prophecy uses this phrase. The Spirit of Jesus Christ. How many of those do we get? 72. Not that many. That's an interesting uh, few of these. Daniel. I like this one. Oh, well, we need to make that much bigger. You're not going to be able to see that. Here we go. Daniel was imbued with the Spirit of Jesus. And he pleaded that the wise men of Babylon should not be destroyed. Isn't that the spirit of Jesus? We can highlight these things. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, I like to do that. Okay. Should not be destroyed. You remember um, Jesus um, reasoning and uh, appealing to James and John. When in Luke chapter 9, they wanted to bring down fire on the Samaritans because they were not being hospitable. And they say, can we bring fire down like Elijah did? And Jesus says, you don't know what spirit is prompting you to even think that. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And here, uh, Daniel had that same spirit. That's what she is uh, pointing out. Let's look at some more here. Man oh, I like to go down to the bottom of the list here. This is where all the manuscripts are. And uh, 1891. Let's go back here. Um, one manuscript uh, 36. There it is. Look at this one. This is an interesting one. It's talking about um, being sanctified, 11, 
No, there's good leaven and bad leaven, not the leaven of malice. That's what he says in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, verse 7. Now let us keep the feast, not with the leaven of malice. This is the feast of unleavened bread. So he's talking about leaven. Not the leaven of jealousy, not the leaven of evil surmisings, but the leaven of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, which is sent down from heaven, called the Holy Ghost. So the Spirit of Jesus Christ is not something different from the Holy Ghost. It is the Holy Ghost. It is the Holy Spirit. In fact, she actually uses the phrase, let's look at this, the Holy Spirit of Christ. Oh, it's not Jesus. <laughs> got to right, gotta get the right words here. Yeah, we got ten of these. The Holy Spirit of Christ. Here's one. And the generous Holy Spirit of Christ working upon the heart will yield in the life of converting influence. There's many, well, there's ten of them. And generous, that's the same thing again. We want the Holy Spirit of Christ in our families. Sometimes this thing doesn't, uh, there it is. We want the Holy Spirit of Christ in our families. Yes. Um, can you grieve the Holy Spirit? Oh, how we grieve the pure Holy Spirit of Christ. That's, you know, grieve not the Holy Spirit, Paul tells us. And it's the Spirit of Christ that we're grieving. Uh, the generous ho Holy Spirit of Christ, working upon the heart, will yield the heart and converting it from... Oh, we read that, didn't we? Operations of the Holy Spirit of Christ. Uh, there's that grieve the pure. There's some of these repeats. Uh, in several situations, under the sanctification of the Holy Spirit. We need, we must have more of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Well, some people say, yeah, that's like team spirit. We're not talking about the Holy Spirit here. But right there, right under the sanctification of the Holy Spirit of Christ. That's His Holy Spirit, he, she, he says, or she says in um, Desire of Ages, page 671, to the very end of the sentence there, uh, the paragraph. Let's look at that. Desire of Ages, 671. Here's where we usually hear this. Sin could be resisted and overcome only, that's an interesting word, only, pretty exclusive, through the mighty agency of the third person of the Godhead, who would come with no modified energy but in the fullness of divine power. And he goes on to say, it is the Spirit. It is by the Spirit, through the Spirit. Then this last text, Christ has given His Spirit as a divine power. Remember, we've got both power and instruction to overcome all hereditary and cultivated tendencies to evil and to impress His own character upon His church. And here's another one, Manuscript 61 from 1910. The sanctification of the Holy Spirit of Christ. Is this different than the Holy Spirit? Let every soul do his best. Stand in the sanctification of the Holy Spirit. Sanctification of the Holy Spirit of Christ. Sanctification of the Holy Spirit. It's the same. Here's why we should understand this very clearly. Uh, Holy Spirit, let's look for this one, which proceeds, let's see where this is, uh, two places, selected, selected message, but the original one is uh, Review and Herald, April 5, 1906, the Holy Spirit, which proceeds from the only begotten Son of God. Now, you read in uh, John 15, 26, it says, uh, that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father in my name, which he will send in my name. Notice this, just a few sentences before this in the previous paragraph, Christ gave to humanity an existence out of himself. This is the divine, pure divinity of his Spirit, which proceeds from the only begotten Son of God. Uh, I really like this one. This is Adventist Home, page 350. Do not forget you have a comforter. Ah, here it is. The Spirit which Christ has appointed. 
You are never alone. Jesus said, uh, I am with you always to the end of the world. If you will listen to the voice that now speaks to you, hmm, which voice is that? If you will respond without delay to the knocking at the door of your heart, come in, Lord Jesus, that I may sup with thee and thee with me. This is Revelation 3.20. The heavenly guest will enter when this element, which is all divine, abides with you, there is peace and rest. The heavenly element, uh, the heavenly guest, this element, which is all divine, it's the pure divinity of Christ, with divested of his uh, personality of humanity. Divested of the personality. Where is that one? There we go, Desire of Ages. That's the modified, rearranged one, so it doesn't have the full impact. But if you look at, uh, let's see, down here in uh, 14MR, this is the original. The Holy Spirit is himself. Well, it's talking about Christ. Christ is the subject here. He cannot be in every place personally. Therefore, it was altogether in vantage that he should leave them and go to the Father and send the Holy Spirit to be his successor. The Holy Spirit is himself. All these pronouns are referring back to Christ. The Holy Spirit is Christ himself, divested of the personality of humanity and independent thereof. He's the only divine being who ever had a personality of humanity to be divested. <laughs> so this, the Holy Spirit is his divinity divested of his humanity. He is both the Son of God, divine, born of the Spirit, he is Spirit, and the Son of Man, human, as flesh, representing humanity before his Father as our advocate, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is both human and divine. It's two natures. Well, there's so much more we could... Uh, following this uh, study, but I hope you've enjoyed following along and maybe give you some inspiration to uh, pursue this and continue looking for other phrases. Some you'll find in uh, the context of what you're reading, and that'll lead you on down other paths. And uh, enjoy and, and explore and dig for those gems in the Word. Uh, blessings to you this day.